This video is made for deck officers who are working on the tankers, or scheduled to join soon. Excuse me, sir. Hold up. Did you just stroll in here without watching part one? Rookie move. Go handle that and then come back. We'll still be here. Still with me after part one? Awesome. Let's fire up part two. This one's free bonus. Here's the pump and COPT test performance curve. You'll probably find it posted on the wall in the cargo control room. Just take a look for reference. This is the steam turbine diagram. You can see the governor and the governor valve is attached to the steam inlet pipe. After the steam rotates the turbine, it exits through the exhaust line and flows into the vacuum condenser. The steam enters here labeled as the steam chest and then through the upper exhaust casing. Baba. The steam inlet is equipped with both the main steam line and the warm-up line. When starting the turbine for the first time, before cargo discharge, opening the warm-up valve here first allows the turbine's RPM to stabilize at around 100 to 200 RPM. This process is known as the turbine warm-up process. Some vessels do not have a warm-up line. In such cases, engineers use an F wrench to slowly and gradually crack open the steam main valve to warm up the turbine maintaining an RPM of around 100 to 200. This is an operation manual from a certain shipping company, and the content is written in a similar way. This manual was also made by the well-known company Shinko, and it is written similarly here as well. Ahem, Sam, would you mind reading it for us? My throat is a bit sore. Yes, Captain. Here you go. Open the steam inlet valve gradually and start the turbine The keep its speed at 100 to 200 RPM to warm up the turbine for 25 minutes. Did you all hear that clearly? Basically, it says to slowly open the steam inlet valve to start the turbine. Also, it instructs to maintain the turbine speed between 100 and 200 RPM for about 25 minutes during the warm-up process. There are two steam inlet valve during the warm-up process, whether to open the smaller warm-up valve or the larger main valve is actually up to the user's preference. I am a bit curious about which valve the engine crew on this vessel prefers to open. Yeah, I am curious about that too. Wow, why is making this video so exhausting? Did I accidentally sign up for a full-time job? Well then, why don't you take a little break? You are not filming an action movie, are you? Should we? <laughs> All right, everyone. Let's take a quick break before we start steaming like this turbine. Teddy, wake up! Might as well just knock it all out while we're at it. Like ripping off a Band-Aid, right? All right, stretch it out, shake it off, and let's get back to it. No slacking now. We're rolling again. Full speed ahead. <laughs> let's go. <laughs> I've pulled up the COPT drawing again. If you look closely, the steam inlet line and the exhaust line look a bit different. Kind of like a skinny guy and a chubby guy. I doubt it was drawn incorrectly. There must be a reason for it, right? So, let's check the document that shows the line sizes and figure it out together. Let's go! Here the steam inlet size is 150 millimeter, while the outlet is 650 millimeter. Wow, there's huge difference between the inlet and outlet pipeline size. Looking at this one, the inlet is 125 millimeter, and the outlet is 400 millimeter. And over here, the inlet is 150 millimeter, while the outlet is 600 millimeter. Why, is there such a big difference between the inlet and outlet sizes? Let's use our imagination for a moment. <laughs> After the steam spins the turbine, it needs to be discharged smoothly. If the outlet size is larger than the inlet pipe it originally passed through, wouldn't that make it easier for the steam to exit? Plus, 
the frictional resistance would also be reduced. It makes sense that optimizing these conditions would improve efficiency. So, let's keep it simple. Doesn't that sound about right? Additionally, this outlet line is directly connected to the vacuum condenser. When operating the COPT, the vacuum condenser creates a constant negative pressure in the exhaust line. Wait, let me clarify. Negative pressure must be maintained. Because of this, having a slightly larger exhaust line allows for more internal volume within the pipe, making it easier to maintain a stable vacuum condition more safely. You all probably already know this without me explaining in detail, right? So let's just move on from this and keep going. For the final part of the COPT, let's briefly talk about the governor valve, which you actually control from the CCR before moving on. According to the Shinko manual, it says, hem. Well, see, the text is a bit blurry. I can't quite make it out. Can someone help me out this time? Ah, Colin, you're the perfect choice. How about you? Give it a read. Hi. Hi, sir. The governor valve is double seat type to prevent and balance by the effect of steam pressure and also acts as an emergency stop valve so that this valve closes to stop the turbine when emergency trip devices work. Good job, Colin. But your voice is a hard to understand. It would be nice if you could read with clearer pauses next tome. Anyway, what this basically means is the governor valve is a double seat type to prevent imbalance caused by steam pressure fluctuations. It also acts as an emergency stop valve, meaning that when the emergency shutdown system is activated, the governor valve closes, stopping the turbine. They call it a double seat type, which probably means that having a dual steam supply section helps stabilize the inlet pressure more effectively. Let's just keep it simple and remember it like that. As for the emergency stop button, you can find it installed in various locations on the vessel, like the manifold, pump room, and CCR, in case of emergency, or when cargo operations are complete, pressing that button will slam the governor valve shut, stopping the turbine. Of course, that also means the cargo pump stops as well. When the cargo discharging operation is complete, pressing this button will typically make the governor valve shut with a boom, stopping the cargo pump for the final shutdown. However, if for any reason you need to perform an emergency stop during cargo discharge, do not hesitate or second guess. Just press the emergency stop button immediately. Let me emphasize this one more time. No hesitation, no second thoughts. Emergency stop button, push. Make sure you remember that. One more time. No hesitation, no second thoughts. Emergency stop button, push. Make sure you remember that. Captain Uncle Charlie, I have a question. If the cargo pump is currently running at its maximum RPM, is it still okay to press the emergency stop button in that situation? All right, let's think about this. Right now, oil is gushing out from the deck pipeline. It's a critical emergency situation. There's no time to call the engine room, lower the RPM, or go through procedures. This is a true emergency. So, don't hesitate. Don't second guess, just press the emergency stop button. The boiler and steam line systems in the engine room have multiple layers of safety mechanisms in place. So, nothing bad will happen. You don't need to worry. Now, if something does go crash, bang, boom, in the engine room after pressing the button, that means something else is wrong. And that's not your fault. Your priority is to handle the emergency first. Don't forget. All right, moving on. This is the governor valve drawing, but it's so small that it's hard to see clearly. On the left side, you can see it labeled as running condition, which means the governor valve is open and the COPT is running. On the right side, it says trip condition, meaning the governor valve is closed and the COPT is not operating. Do you see the lever that moves the governor valve? That's called the governor lever. It works like a seesaw or a lever, moving up and down to open and close the valve. Whoo! Since the manufacturer's drawing is too small to see clearly, I just went ahead and drew it myself. At least this way, we can get a better look at how it moves. It might not be the best drawing, but hey, it should be good enough to understand. <laughs> Looking at this drawing, you can easily understand what a double seat type is. 
The governor valve has two seats, one on the top and one on the bottom, so that's why it's called a double seat type. Now to wrap things up, I'll explain the emergency stop and then we'll conclude the COPT section. The text here is pretty blurry again. This time let's get Sam's help. Hey Sam, could you read it for us one more time? Yes, Uncle Charlie. First local stopping. Push the hand trip knob provided on the trip casing on the reduction gear casing so that the spindle moves downward and the governor valve closes through actuation of the trip mechanism and the turbine stops as shown in figure 3.1 and 3.2. What this means is that if you look at the bottom of the COPT, you'll see a hand trip knob, just like in this picture. When you operate this knob, the governor valve closes, stopping the turbine. This is called a local stop. If the engine room decides to perform a local stop, someone has to physically go to the COPT and manually operate the knob to stop the turbine. <laughs> Sam, can you go ahead and read the second part about remote stop as well? Second, remote stopping. Push the remote stop switch provided in the remote control room so that the trip mechanism actuates to close the governor valve to stop the turbine. Good job, Sam. When we say remote stop, it literally means stopping the turbine remotely by operating the emergency stop button in the CCR, or in other words, the remote stop switch. Or in other words, the remote stop switch. Or in other words, the remote stop switch. Bang, bang. This video shoot is more tiring than hitting the gym. And that's a wrap for part two. To be continued in part three. If you found this helpful, please like and subscribe. Thank you.